So if you're creating video, putting it on your own website, and if you have budget for PPC, AdWords, or social ads, where you can get really, really targeted and bring the people that you want to talk to, to your site, um, not by asking them to convert right away, because we know right. that that doesn't really work, um, you know, but by offering them value, then those are the few ways that I would get started. Okay. We are all set. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm genuinely excited. So, um, <laughs> Good. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to the In the Know series. Today we have Jackie Hermes. Um, I'm super pumped to be talking with you, Jackie. Um, just uh, following you on LinkedIn for a number of years now. Um, and I just want to let everybody know, for those that don't, um, who Jackie is. So she is the founder and CEO of Excelity. They focus on B2B SaaS marketing. Um, she's also the co-founder of the Women's Entrepreneurship Week, and I'm pretty sure that's out of Milwaukee, correct? Correct, yep. She's also the former head of marketing at Zywave, um, and she got her MBA from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee. So super happy to have you here, Jackie. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about building an audience from scratch. Um, so in order to do that, I kind of wanted to start off with your experience and how you've been able to do that for yourself. Mm, yeah. Um, so building an audience for scratch, I've done myself, I guess, a few times. One for Excelity, my company, and by myself, I mean, really, like I have a whole team that's done it with me. Um, and then on the other hand, on LinkedIn. So it's been a definitely different process both ways. I remember when I started Excelity and we were getting our marketing automation platform in place, I think I pulled like 60 contacts out of my Gmail account and was like, okay, you know, like, let's go do some marketing. Um, and now I think we have maybe 20,000 or so subscribers in our database, which is awesome, all organic growth. Um, and we've really done that via inbound marketing and owned content. We haven't done a ton of PPC, PPC or anything like that. Um, now that is a really long road. It takes a really long time to build a database to that level um, when you're bringing everything inbound and it's hard to get the right people in, in the database. Um, so, I mean, that's a journey we can definitely talk about a little bit more. And then my LinkedIn I've been working on for about two and a half years now, which is kind of crazy. It seems like I started yesterday and we are nearing 70,000 followers, um, which that, that one I take a little bit different approach where I'm relating to business owners really by sharing my stories of building my own business. And we've been able to, we take a different approach where we're not just posting content related to the target audience that Excelity is trying to sell. I'm relating them more on like a person to person, professional to professional level. Um, and then we are working on building the audience on the back end by adding people in our ideal um, target market to my network. Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. So I guess when it comes to like building that inbound strategy. Um, so it sounds like obviously you've done a fair amount of posting content yourself, but on top of that, have you been producing content as the business entity itself or has it been more so um, just you and your team? Yeah, so the business has been producing content as well. Excelity has God, probably hundreds of different resources, videos, blogs, and whatnot on our website. So yeah, we do produce a, a good amount of content, which has been a challenge this year in COVID, right? Because we're producing content more like this than the, the in-person type shoots that we used to do before. Okay. So I'm just trying to think if I am a CMO and I'm listening to this um, and I don't have my own business, but I'm a part of something, how... How do you jumpstart that or how would you try to to get an initiative like this going? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were hesitant to start on, we were really good at creating certain types of content. So we've always been really, really strong with um, like written content. Our design team is amazing. We can produce, you know, like white papers and eBooks and stuff like that, like nobody's business. 
but that stuff is kind of going out of style a little bit where we're moving more to more web hosted content versus downloadable content. We're not gating as much. Um, and so we have evolved to doing more video. And I, you know, I always thought we needed like a ton of really nice equipment and everything to get started with video. And then I remember I was at HubSpot's inbound conference, like maybe four or five years ago. And I saw a presentation about how this agency started producing really high quality video with like a thousand dollars and they were using their iPhones and they were documenting and it was, you know, it's not like a hundred thousand dollar, like produced documentary style um, video, but it is real. It's every day. It's us picking up, you know, our phones and like documenting what we're doing. Um, and that is how I would suggest getting started. That is we've moved from much more produced video during COVID to much more, you know, like shooting via Zoom and shooting via iPhones. And frankly, the engagement and the quality, the quality has gone down a little, but the engagement has not. So that's how I would get started. Yeah. And I think right now it's interesting because it's almost acceptable to be able to do it that way. You know, and if, uh, if you're posting last year and it was at home content, like you know, people would see it for what it is and it was never a big deal. And I feel like LinkedIn, you see a lot of people just doing the handheld stuff. But mm -hmm. um, I remember you had a post where you talked about like being up underneath your, your face and <laughs> looking up your nose. I thought it was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, I think right now there's just so little resistance to being able to do this. Um, and I think as there are fewer in-person experiences, why wouldn't you take that digital? And we see this with clients too, because we used to do a lot of lunch and learns and we'd go and present to people and it's like, well, you know, how can you do that right now? And why wouldn't you move digital and try to do these things and to expand your reach to thousands of people instead of, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 people in a single room? Yeah, I, it's interesting lately, I've been talking about with certain or with a few people about the, the hidden blessings and the silver linings of this year. Now, it's been an absolutely horrible year for a lot of people. I certainly don't want to downplay all this. And I mean, our business, we lost like 40% of our business from March to April and had to kind of like claw our way back from that. It's been an absolute roller coaster. But at the same time, there are tons of hidden, hidden blessings, just like what you're talking about. So I never would have moved from feeling like I had to do the much more like professionally produced content to shooting it on my iPhone if I hadn't been forced to. I never would have moved from running Women's Entrepreneurship Week in person where we had, we ran 62 events last year, which was insane. We moved wow. it all online this year. We ran a fraction of the events, only 16 events, and we had still two thirds of the number of attendees. So think about that, like, and, and, and our satisfaction score this year was like half a point higher than it was last year on a five point scale, which is crazy. I never, ever would have moved all of that online unless we had been forced to. And now we're kind of seeing all of these, you know, we're, we're willing to accept more or different because we have to this year. And I'm really interested to see what sticks around after this. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess to, to break things down, and make it a little bit more tactile or usable. Obviously, we've talked about LinkedIn, but what other platforms are are you guys using? And like, I'm just trying to think for the principals and CMOs that are listening, like what's going to be least resistance for them? Um, I know YouTube's a player, like podcasts, LinkedIn. How do you view the whole, um, I don't know, uh, video scape, if you will? Mm -hmm. We have a few clients that are running podcasts. It's something that I want to get started too. So maybe they'll have to pick your brain after this. Um, and we are not big into YouTube right now. Um, most of our clients are, because we're getting them started, sometimes we're launching products absolutely from scratch where they have a website or like a shell of a website and they don't have a single person video or visiting it. So what I typically like to do is really focus and get really good at certain channels. So one of of those channels is typically LinkedIn. And then I love to create, like I said, owned content. So if you're creating video, putting it on your own website, and if you have budget for PPC AdWords or social ads, where you can get really, really targeted and bring the people that you want to talk to, to your site, um, not by asking them to convert right away, because we know right. that that doesn't really work, um, you know, but by offering them value, then those are the 
few ways that I would get started. I do think there's a lot of opportunity in podcasts. And I keep hearing people say like, oh, I'm not going to start a podcast because there's so many of them now. And it's like, so who cares? Right. There's there's room for everyone at the table. So oh. that's something I'm looking forward to exploring myself as well. Yeah. And also, if you look at it from a positioning standpoint, like, yeah, there are a lot of podcasts, but are there podcasts for accounting firms that only specialize in working with athletes? You know what I mean? So if you're if you're niche down and you know, like your differentiator, um, you know, you can put things together. So it all revolves around that. And it's not super similar to everybody else's. So, yeah, that's it's you're absolutely right, though. There are a lot there are a lot of podcasts out there. So there definitely are. But when you talk, I mean, you just hit it exactly on the head in the need for specificity. That is the most important thing when you're creating content, the more specific you can get. And it's funny because I think a lot of companies think like, oh, well, but if I get that specific, it could apply over here and I'm missing out on this audience over here. But the fact is you miss the whole audience if you don't get specific. Right. So, you know, if you can start a podcast that is specific to your audience that you're trying to reach, power to you. I think you should do it. Right. Yeah. And also, I guess for the firms or the people that are listening that, um, you know, it's more of an engagement type of sale or you're trying to increase lead gen, like if you can establish yourself or your firm as the industry experts and people can get to feel like they know you and what you stand for before they even reach out, that's what this is all kind of designed to do, you know, because you're creating that intellectual property and it becomes a library. And then once they reach out, well, they already feel like they know you. And that's such an advantage as, a, as opposed to you calling and reaching out and trying to work things backwards. So um, yeah, I, I see it. I see more companies starting to do it, which is good, but I feel like there are just so many that it's not really on the map. So, so. yeah, it, it's been so dang cool, like making my company our own best case study and doing all of those things for ourselves. So we mm -hmm. have companies that'll reach out to me and say, like, we don't have budget at all to hire anyone yet. But as soon as we finish this raise or we make some sales or whatever it is, you're going to be the first person that I reach out to. And it's like, that's amazing that you're able to build like trust and like ability and those kind of relationships online. And I think that's really what all companies should be doing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and I guess we could kind of talk about that particular subject for a really long time. Um, but if we get back to who's listening, I'm just trying to think like, what topics granted, or given the current climate, um, or current events going on right now, what topics are off limits, would you say, or um, maybe not so favorable versus topics that are kind of trending or hot, if you will? To me, nothing is off limits. Everything is about how you approach it um, and what you say. It's so, for example, I mean, this is, I don't know how related this is to the question, but I was listening to a, a podcast where they are talking about celebrating success and how companies and like personal, you shouldn't be celebrating your personal or your business success right now because there's so much bad stuff going on in the world. And I completely disagree with that. I think you that, Absolutely. you know, I, and, and so that's one where it can definitely be 100% tone deaf to be like, you know, just completely ignore everything that's going on in the world and celebrate yourself. I completely understand that, but you can show empathy and be happy and you can care about other people and still understand that for some people, this has been a good year and there are good things happening. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I mean, I think that like what's off limits and what's good to talk about is such a, it's such a black and white look at it. Um, and I don't know, to me, the whole world is gray, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I like what you said about, no, it, that makes complete sense. I like what you said about, um, and I think you had a post about it today, but just like how, you know, if things are tough for certain individuals, that's no means to like hold back on how you may be doing well that you have, you're right. You can't be tone deaf about it, but like it, what, what if everybody had that approach and everybody was just like super negative or they just weren't sharing anything positive? Like it'd be pretty dogmatic, I feel like. So yeah, I think I totally, totally agree with that. A lot of people online with like cancel culture and everything that's happening right now have been getting just like 
hated on online for like it comes to mind the kardashians for going on their lavish vacation or whatever and they're like people in the world are suffering and you're on this vacation or Lori harder is someone that i follow and she her father-in-law passed away and they didn't feel comfortable flying so they took a private jet and it's like oh you're on a private jet but there's so much suffering in the world and it's like we could always talk about stuff like that, but I would rather focus on the positive and, you know, like help where I can, but keep focusing on, so like your mission in business or whatever you want to do. Yeah. And provide value while you're doing it or some, uh, some perspective to it. So yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, I guess to keep the conversation going, I want to switch gears a little bit. So Obviously, you've done a really solid job of building your own um, influence on LinkedIn in particular, but how I've noticed some of your other team members are too, and I just don't see that a lot with companies, and I, I don't think it's super easy for um, you know certain individuals to convince the team to pick that up. So I don't know what you've been able to do to instill that in the culture at Excelity, but maybe you could kind of walk me through that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting question because when I decided that I really, I saw a few members of my team just starting to create content and I decided to ask the entire team to create a certain amount of content one quarter. It was like the beginning of 2019 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, everyone was not super excited about it. And it's a, it's a fine line because LinkedIn is technically, it's a business channel, but it's a personal channel. Right. And so they should be able to talk about whatever they want. I think where companies go wrong is when they're like, we are putting out this marketing campaign and here is the approved line for you to go put on your LinkedIn. And it's like, okay, no one really wants to do that, frankly. Um, and when I gave them, I gave them this challenge to post only six weeks, six pieces of content in 12 weeks. Um, so it's one piece of content every other week. It could have been written, photo, video, if you're comfortable, totally up to you, articles, text, whatever. Um, and, and I asked them to focus on what matters to them professionally, their own skills, and whatever medium is most comfortable for them. So then it doesn't, it doesn't turn into this, like we're all here to promote the company and you know, like spew the company lines, but it's them showcasing what they're good at and letting people get to know them and like them. And that's exactly what I wanted. So my, my designer um, or one of them, she really did not want to go on video at all. She does not like coming out from behind the camera. And I was like, great, you know, you do whatever you want to do. So she produced a really cool video on how to make video on a budget and put it on LinkedIn. That got some great traction. She wrote a few articles. Um, Our head of operations does like shooting videos. And she's talked about her career from moving from a marketer into this operations role where, you know, she didn't even know she was headed, but she's so dang good at it. And she puts out her own content. So I think that that challenge is really what got them all going. And then after that, I said, you know, like you, if you want to keep putting out content, go for it. Um, If you don't, it's totally up to you. And some of them have stuck with it. And frankly, it just helps so much in building the company because when people come to us, they know me, but they know our head of sales. They know our head of operations. They know some of the people they're going to be working with already. Yeah. And and that's, it's so tricky because I mean, like I've, I guess internally here, we've tried to promote that culture and I don't know if it just happens to be the group that we have, but it it can be really challenging to get them to, to actually go and post. So, um, so yeah, do you have any like words of wisdom for maybe people that are a little bit more stubborn when it comes to that, or do you just not push it too much? I don't push it a ton, but I do really encourage them to do it and position it as a, you know, like classic sales, what's in it for them. Um, Mm -hmm. One of, one of our, one of our like most junior employees one day said, you know, I'm working really hard on Excelity's content and no one is interacting with it. And if we do not focus on this company and all work to grow it, no one's getting raises. So you better get it together and start and start interacting on our content. 
And it was so funny because she's, I mean, she graduated from college maybe a year ago. I was super not expecting that to come from her, but dang, it was effective. And now our team members are out there promoting and sharing and doing all those things. So I think if you can figure out what's in it for them, um, I mean, you're giving people the gift of building a personal brand on company time. That's incredible. Honestly, I don't know a lot of companies that would allow and pay employees to build their own brand because we all know, you know, like my entire team right now is not going to retire with Excelity. That's just a realistic fact. And so whatever they're able to build while I'm paying them, they get to take with them. And I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and that's the way you have to frame it too. And I don't know, we kind of say that here as well. Like, yeah, if you build these connections and you you kind of build your network, um, if something happens to Venzo or you know you go a different career path, you still take that with you. And so I think that's just so important to stress. Um, so we're actually about to wrap up. Um, obviously, we've been talking about um, pretty much everything that has to do with building an audience from the ground up. Um, but I would say that the top three things we've really learned are – you have to provide value. I think that was one of the things you really stressed is just providing value with folks and they get to know you and there's an element of transparency. And then I would say also niching. Um, you did touch on that quite a bit. So like you do have to be able to have the right audience to actually create content for, which is super important. And then lastly, we discussed team and getting team involvement. Um, so I don't know if you kind of wanted to to address any of those points, but that's kind of uh, the, the three big takeaways that I've really picked up on here. So, yeah, I would say one last thing to add to that is don't be afraid to dig in and do like the hard legwork. I think that a lot of companies, when you start to build an audience, they want to do the work that's going to reach a wide audience, right? So if my audience is accounting firms, I want to be able to reach all of them with everything that I put out. Whereas I would argue that, especially if you're in an enterprise type environment, um, I would be making lists and selecting specific companies and specific people that you want in your pipeline and your network and going and working to get them in. Because mm -hmm. once you build the trust of those specific people and companies, then others will start to notice you. They will trust you as well. But at the beginning, you have to do that like work. I think that's super important. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a, an awesome point to end on. But before we end, um, I want to hand the... Uh, all of the spotlight over to you. Um, hit us with a 30 second shameless plug. <laughs> okay, so Excelity works with B2B SaaS companies, pre revenue fundraising up to about $30 million, some private equity owned, some VC backed, really any B2B SaaS companies that are looking to grow quickly in an enterprise environment. So hit us up if that's you. We would love to work with you. Awesome. And I guess if people want to follow you or engage with you, how can they do that? Yes. Well, LinkedIn is going to be the best place to find me. Um, I'm on pretty much every platform as the Jackie Hermes, just Jackie Hermes was taken. So added a on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to do what you have to do, right? So oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, obviously we'll be in touch and um, to your success. Yes. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.